Last year I did a video on the Russian woodpecker, a name given to a Soviet over the horizon radar that made shortwave listening virtually impossible for many people during the 1970s and 1980s. I'll link that video below and at the end of this one so you can get the full story, but I wanted to bring you some more information on what life was like while the woodpecker was at large, and how people attempted to combat this nuisance signal in more detail than I did in the previous video. I also have to point out that a lot of people seem to get upset over me calling this nuisance the Russian woodpecker when it was Soviet and actually based in Ukraine. Well, in short, the Soviet Union was started by the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin, who was Russian. Russia became the country most identified with the Soviet Union in the Western world during this time, therefore the signal became known the world over, at least in the radio community, as the Russian woodpecker, and that's the name it's still referred to as to this day. It should be readily realised in the radio hobby that what is one man's interference is another man's interest. Number stations and the various shortwave oddities that have surfaced over the years have proven this point. If you monitor the online SDRs, you'll see dozens of people sat listening to the buzzer. Such was the case with the USSR OTHB, or Over the Horizon Backscatter Radar. Also known as the Woodpecker or Pulsar, this device drew much interest by the interference it generated, and mainly how to combat it. In fact, the World Radio Television Handbook's 1984 edition reviewed two products designed to counter this interference. This super powerful mysterious radio signal apparently emanated from the Soviet Union. You have to remember that during the 1970s and 1980s when this thing was prevalent, we weren't sure on its location at first. It had been disrupting communications throughout the world since 1976. So severe was the interference caused by the transmissions that it had disrupted CB, maritime, aeronautical, telecommunications and amateur radio operations to the point that certain channels became virtually useless. From August 25th 1976, the Federal Communications Commission had written four complaints to the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications in Moscow, but had not received a reply by the time this information became public six months later. Precisely what was generating the mysterious signals, what type of intelligence, if any, the Soviets were carrying out, and what their purpose was, were all unanswered questions, at least to the FCC. What was certain, however, is that the FCC had several hundred complaints, and that the transmissions were heard around the world. Colin Thomas, for example, who was Worldwide Coordinator of Interference Reports for the International Amateur Radio Union, said that reports of interference from these transmissions had come from amateurs in Sweden, Norway, Germany, the United States and Australia. The source of the problem lies in the USSR, Thomas said. There are thought to be three transmitters involved, but the purpose of the transmissions, this we do not know. Thomas said all his interference reports were sent to the British Home Office and then telegraphed to the Russians, but as with the FCC complaints, there was no answer initially. So severe had the interference become and so unresponsive had the Russians been to complaints from other countries that the matter was referred to the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, in Geneva. A spokesperson said that the ITU had no power to enforce international radio treaties against interference, but simply tries to mediate such matters. Nevertheless, another ITU source said that the organisation did have a file on the mysterious transmissions. He said correspondence had been passed to the Russians through the ITU's International Frequency Regulation Board in connection with the matter. King T. Hall, Chief Watch Officer at the FCC's monitoring branch, said that the Commission had been getting complaints almost daily since early July of 1976. He said the complaints had come from basically every shortwave radio user. So, the woodpecker was causing a big problem for many, but what could they do? Well, there were a couple of devices marketed to the public. One known as the Woodpecker Killer, after it was featured in television's Tomorrow's World and advertised in amateur radio magazines. Daytong, a radio equipment company, came up with a cure, the SRB2 Automatic Woodpecker Blanker. It was designed to cut out interference pulses at both RF and AF on high frequency bands and operate completely automatically. This was done by circuitry that analysed the woodpecker signal and tailored the width, number and position of the blanking signal to match. Daytong said it could even remove more than one woodpecker at a time. 
It acted by stopping the woodpecker signal from reaching the receiver's antenna input, while the AF Blanco removed any remaining clicks from the loudspeaker. The SRB2 connected in series with the antenna and loudspeaker terminals, and internal modifications were not required. Like all good ideas, it didn't come cheap. The price of £86.25 included VAT, and the automatic woodpecker Blanca was available from Daytong stockists, or from Daytong themselves, at Mill Lane in Leeds. These devices worked with mixed results. The overall consensus from what I've read was that they were okay, but weren't really successful in completely blanking out the woodpecker. The Association of North American Radio Clubs began preparing an organised listening and logging project to be presented formally to major policymakers who have, and I quote, clout in 1985. The concerted listening effort was conducted in the 5 to 3 MHz spectrum over a 24-hour period in October of that year. But in order to make this effort successful, hundreds of serious monitors were needed, each of whom would be committed to monitoring a 3-hour period. The group behind this effort claimed that this project would cost a large amount of money. I don't know why. So they sold a newsletter for $2 and no woodpecker t-shirts for $10. So I can't help but think that this may have been some sort of money-making exercise rather than any real attempt to stop the woodpecker. During the period that the woodpecker was active, a few ingenious hams came up with a way to give the woodpecker a taste of its own medicine. Radar works on the echo principle. Radio waves are sent out and then received again. If the waves have bounced off an object, such as an aircraft, their echo is different from the others. Ham radio operators began taping the sound of the interference. They then turned their beam antennas directly at Russia, increased their power to the legal limit of 100 watts, yeah right, and played the woodpecker's racket directly back to them. After about 5 seconds, the hams claim that this counter-interference totally scrambled the woodpecker's echo and made it completely useless as a radar device. They said that they'd actually heard the woodpecker shut down after this return fire. Unfortunately, it usually started up again at a slightly higher or lower frequency. Not even the most dedicated woodpecker plucker could spend all of his time defeathering this persistent bird. A note in some amateur radio magazines tried to drum up some support for a plan whereby all operators paused in their contacts for one day and play back the woodpecker noise. And finally, a theory that was linked to the woodpecker, mind control and mental health. Ira Einhorn, writing in Coevolution Quarterly in 1978, noted the exact synchronicity between the woodpecker's shortwave pulses and naturally occurring alpha brainwave frequencies. In his article, A Disturbing Communique, No. 16, Winter 1977-1978, Einhorn advanced the opinion that the Russians were engaged in a sinister mind-control experiment of Orwellian dimensions. His theory was widely discounted, but according to an AP report, Dr. Ross Ad, Chief of Research at the Pettis Memorial Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda, California, obtained from Soviet colleagues a mini woodpecker transmitter known as the LEADER. Operating on a frequency of 40 MHz, the mini woodpecker apparently bombarded the brain with low frequency radio waves and was being used experimentally by the Russians as a replacement for tranquilizers and their unwanted side effects. The pulsed radio waves, quote, stimulated the brain's own electromagnetic current and produced a trance like state, according to the report. The Russian language manual obtained by AD described the use of the mini woodpecker. The manual said it's a distant pulse treatment apparatus for psychological problems including sleeplessness, hypertension and neurotic disturbances. Soviet psychiatrists routinely classified neurotic disturbances as many acts of overt political protest directed against the state establishment. Dr. Aidy described his own experiments with the leader in which a cat was placed within the pulsed RF field of the transmitter. Within a matter of two or three minutes, the cat is sitting there very quietly. It stays almost as though it were transfixed, he said. The animal remains uninterested in its surroundings for about half an hour after the RF field is shut down. The AP report concluded that the leader may have been the forerunner of a device that was presently bombarding Europe and the United States with very powerful radio waves in the 6 to 30 MHz shortwave range by the mid 1980s. Was the mini woodpecker theory just an elaborate piece of Soviet disinformation designed to send Western researchers scrambling down a blind alley while the Soviet concocters of the hoax laugh it up? It's highly likely. 
80 successful animal tests would seem to quash the hoax hypothesis, but we only had his report. It doesn't take an expert to see straight through his account of the cat's reaction to radio waves. It's important to point out that there's been zero evidence of the woodpecker's ability to induce a state of catatonic trance in Western radio amateurs and shortwave listeners, because as the world later found out, it was just an over-the-horizon radar.